God's grace is yours and his peace from our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. His word for our consideration this morning is from today's third reading, the gospel lesson for today. The last words of the gospel of Matthew from chapter 28, especially verses 18 through 20. Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. God's Word. It's probably safe to say that there are no atheists in this room right now. I don't see anybody jumping up, no hands going up. Good, I was a little bit worried about that. <laughs> Maybe some of you were atheists at one time or another. And really when you get right down to it, there's a streak of that in all of us. There is no God. Or if there is a God, maybe, maybe I'll just fudge that a little bit and say, could be, maybe not. We call those people agnostics. But did you know, and I don't know, you don't have to be a Jeopardy fan or anything like that, but did you know that in the last 25 years, the number of atheists, people who claim to be atheists of the total population, has gone from a single digit number to more than 25%. And if it keeps going at the same rate year by year by year, by the year 2038, more than half of the world will call themselves atheists. So in a typical room like this, half of us would be Christians, half of us would be atheists. Why? Why? Is it because of our technical age that we don't need God anymore? Now you can find an app for that and put it on your smartphone, right? We don't need God anymore because we have all of the other gadgets for a comfortable life, for a productive and a useful life. And if we don't, they're going to be invented pretty soon anyway, or new ones will take the place of, of the old ones that we've been using for, for all this time. And if there is a God, if he does exist, this is what turns a lot of people away from him, why does he let so many bad things happen in this world? Why is there trouble? Why is there unrest politically? Why? Are there still diseases to conquer? Why is there still sickness? Why can't people just get along? It's good to consider the essence of God, who God is, not just that he still exists, he never went away, he didn't move, but his creations surely seem to have moved. And especially today, we'll take a little time out to do that based on the words of our, our gospel lesson for today, which are familiar words to, to us. But those words have a meaning that, that describes everything you need to know about God. And Jesus' parting words there before his ascension to his closest followers, a few of them anyway, he leaves us with a description of everything we know about God. In those words, he describes God's very being or, or God's essence, what God is like, in other words, who he is. You didn't see that there? You didn't see that anywhere in the Bible? There, there's more that you'd like to know about who God is and what he's like? Well, Jesus does mention some names here. Names are always good. Names identify the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But you know enough about Scripture so that if you put those names together, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, along with what it says in the Old Testament in the book of Deuteronomy, where Israel is urged to pray, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. 
Mathematically, it just wouldn't compute. It would be illogical. It would be a maze to the human mind. And maybe that's one reason why so many people are atheists, because the math is complicated. Three does not equal one. One does not equal three. Now, it's a mystery. And people have, for years, tried to explain this with sort of limping illustrations. Well, God is like, like water. You know, water has different forms. There's ice, it's a solid. There's water, it's a liquid that we can drink. There's water that's a vapor, steam, fog, humidity, monsoon season. Or another comparison that sometimes is made. Well, here's one. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm a pastor. But I'm just one guy. Is God like that? Is that a little better insight? Is that a little bit of a better description as to what God is really like? Or would we just be better off brushing it all away and saying, as long as you believe in some sort of supreme being, as long as uh, you adhere to some concept of divine design, you're good with God, and that's all you're ever going to know, that's as far as you're ever going to get in your description of God. Good enough. Take it or leave it. Well, for hundreds of years, Christians have known everything about God that he's revealed about himself in his word. Hasn't always made sense, hasn't always computed, but we have formulated statements of belief that describe what we believe about God. There's that statement of belief called the Apostles' Creed, the one that tells us and the rest of the world that we believe in God the Father Almighty, the Maker, the Creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, and in the Holy Spirit who has enlightened us and opened our eyes and brought us to faith. We also confess our faith or state our beliefs in the words of the Nicene Creed. You and I use that one in our worship regularly, too, because it puts forth the fact that the Son of God is not just an illusion, but He really is true God, who is also fully human. And then there's that statement of belief that, that we're using today, the Athanasian Creed, which sets forth the truth about God as known from Scripture, Yet not three gods, but one God. Bewildering words? No, very concise words. Words that lay out everything we know about God as far as his being or essence is concerned. But we also know a lot about God from what he has done. Our first reading this morning brought that home to us once more. From the very beginning, God made the heavens and the earth, Moses tells us there in the book of Genesis. From the very beginning, God made all of this out of nothing. You and I have no idea what that's like. For us to make something, for us to construct something, we have to have raw material, don't we? We might call it a creation. We might make something in the kitchen and call it a creation and serve it to the family. You might make something in your workshop, call that a creation. But it still needed raw material, didn't it? God made everything out of nothing. Human beings have discovered a thing called uh, nuclear power, fission or fusion, if you take it in that direction too, scientifically. And after it was discovered, it was harnessed of sorts so that it produced power. Light, the very first thing that God created, has been used in constructive ways for us in the form of lasers. You've got one, for example, in your DVD player, probably one that you'll use in your car on your way home today. Eye surgery. All wonderful things and uses, but God created it in the first place. Human beings only discovered it and developed it. Chemicals. Chemicals help us fight disease, help us rid our homes of pests. Chemicals help us grow our food. And yet God put all the raw materials there too. 
It's what God did that tells us everything we know about God. There's no end of what human beings are going to discover, it seems like, as long as God lets this world stand. But yet God made it all. And unlike the factory worker who really doesn't ever see the product that he or she has made once it gets pushed out the factory door, God still preserves us. That's what God does. That tells us something about God. The things we take for granted. Yeah, the air we breathe, the food we eat, how poetic that sounds, and how little we think about it from day to day. God still preserves us, giving us everything we need for our body and life. As Luther explained the first article of the Apostles' Creed, good weather, good government, peace, health, education, honor, all the things that we pray for when we ask, give us today our daily bread. That's who God is. That's what God does. That's one of the wonderful works of God as far as his work of preservation is concerned. Because as the Apostle Paul reminded us, in him we live and move and have our being. Not only our very essence, but God's essence shows through that way as well. But there's one more thing that tells us everything we know about God. And this is the best one of all. God is love, Scripture tells us. Well, now we might argue, and rightfully so, well, if God is love, how come I don't see more of it in my life? How come a little love doesn't go a long way in my life? How come people on this earth don't show more love toward one another? If they did, wouldn't we all get along better? And how often haven't I been guilty of not showing love? I've been mean, I've been nasty, I've been uncaring, inconsiderate, rude. I have always thought of myself first. Yeah, there's a big difference, there's a big gap, isn't there? When scripture tells us God is love, what does that mean? Well, it means that from before God created time, he decided that his very special creation, human beings, were going to get into trouble, to put it mildly, were going to violently disobey him, and yet he would rescue them. And in time, God would do exactly that. He would send his son. His son would take the place of every violator of humans, of, of, of God's law, because he was also human. The Apostle Paul reminds the Galatians that he was made under law, made to redeem those who were under law. That's, that's every one of us since Adam and Eve. Every one of God's creation has been a law breaker. God is love to do something like that. And then not only did his son voluntarily set aside his glory and become a human being and keep the law perfectly for us, he paid the price for all of our violations, for all of our offenses, for all of the lack of love that we have shown. He was made to be sin for us. He took our place there too. He was in God's crosshairs of anger and absorbed the blow completely. That is love. That is what we know about God. That is what his record tells us over and over again. And his record tells us that not only was this predicted and carried out exactly, but it was enough. It was accomplished exactly as God has planned, had planned and predicted. How do we know that? Because Scripture tells us. He was raised again for our justification. There's the proof on Easter morning when Christ came to life again. After paying that tremendous price, God guaranteed it. God accomplished what he set out to do, to rescue sinful human beings. That's how God is love. Now, that same Savior, that same one who came to life again is 40 days later on this hillside, on this mountaintop, talking to his disciples, giving them some last words. He's telling them, go. 
I'm not going to be around much longer, but you go now. You make disciples of all nations. How? Teaching and baptizing. And you do this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. They didn't quibble, they didn't argue, they didn't say, eh, what can we know about this Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit who worked faith in them, had opened their eyes. They believed. This is the God of truth. This is the God who is three persons and yet one God. This is the God the people of what we call the Old Testament knew just as well. And this is the God that we see today. Oh, not visibly. He's there in the water of baptism. He's there along with the bread and wine and the Lord's Supper. And He is with us in His promise to be with us always. He will not leave us. He will not forsake us. His Word goes with us. His Word reinforces what we already know. His Word goes against all those doubts we have, all those persuasions that might sneak into our life. Yeah, don't say you're not immune because none of us is. To become an atheist, to cast it all aside and say, eh, this would be easier, this would be more logical, there is no God. Just remember who God is, what He is like, what He has done and the wonderful way He has done it. And remember His love. Because you are more than a token of that love. You are a direct object of that love. Now, go and make disciples, knowing that he is with you always to the very end of this age. Amen.